over a couple of pages to chapter 10 in Exodus, a few verses I'm going to read there, Exodus chapter 10, beginning at verse number 7, which says, And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not that yet that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall, go, that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old and with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Amen. You may be seated. Now, you might ask yourself, what's the connection between what's going on in John and what went on in Exodus? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ asked the question of the disciples, which connects the two together, I believe. The Lord Jesus, as we'll see this morning, had gone into some very difficult and hard teaching. And the, re the response of the people was, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? So they decided to stop following Jesus. And when you get saved, the moment you believe, you receive all the Holy Spirit, it's possible for you to receive, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. You cannot go to hell, even if you wanted to go to hell. As, as one preacher used to say, I can, I can swing over hell on a rotten piece of rope, singing Amazing Grace, and that rope would not snap. Amen. You are hell proof. You cannot lose your salvation. Amen. However, what the devil can do is offer you a compromise that dilutes your testimony and your life as a Christian. And this is what's going on here in the book of John. This is what went on in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh said, you can go and serve the Lord on my plan instead of God's plan. And we live in a time and an age today where people say, yes, you can be a Christian. But don't take it too far. Don't be too extreme. Don't believe that Bible, especially. Have you ever noticed when you tell them that you're King James only? When you believe that the King James Bible is the perfect word of God, that look, that, that, that stare of you poor soul. Have you ever gone through that? You can believe the Bible is the word of God, but don't take it too far. You can follow Jesus, but on Sunday, on Monday, Tuesday, and all the rest of the weeks, just live like everybody else. The Lord Jesus in his teaching, as we'll see in John chapter 6, remember he had taught them he was the bread of life. And we saw last week how that you need bread, amen. Daily bread, bread's a good thing. Uh, a question was asked in the book of Isaiah, and it says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And sad to say, much of the bread we buy today is not real bread. It might say bread, but it's not real bread. If you've ever had fresh bread from the oven, amen, you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever gone to France and many of these European countries, Poland and all the rest of it, and you go to the bread shop in the morning and you get some bread, real bread, and you take some butter or even some hummus, amen, or some olive oil and you see, I'm making you all hungry now, aren't I? <laughs> and and, and you, you taste real bread. Well, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And the disciples were saying, now, wait a minute. Who does this person think he is? Is he greater than Moses? And they said, wait a minute. You fit. Now, remember, there was a feeding of the 5,000. In fact, it was more than 5,000. 5,000 men. They said, wait a minute. Moses fed us in the wilderness for 40 years. You've given us one, one day bread. And we saw last week how they're trying to say, well, what can you do for us that's better than our religion? Amen. And Jesus is trying to show them that he himself is the one who is worthy of all our praise and all our belief. What is it they didn't understand? 
They didn't understand his person. Let's look at verse 52 of John chapter 6. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, Now notice this, how can this man give us, us, our, give us his flesh to eat? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now you have to remember that Jesus was among the people he grew up with. They knew he was a carpenter. They knew his family. They knew where he came from. They knew him very well. And he said, how can this man, who's he? They didn't understand, even though Jesus was beginning to reveal to them that he was the very Messiah. He was uh, Yeshua HaMashiach. He was the Messiah. And they were starting to say, wait a minute, you're gone too far. Isn't it amazing how your relatives are that way when you tell them you're saved? Amen. Amen. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're taking this too far. You can go to the football game that's just down the road from here. And you can shout and scream for whatever team you like. And you can just lose the place altogether. And that's fine. But if you're a Christian, keep it to yourself. Who do you think you are? They said the same things to Jesus. They didn't understand about his person. They didn't understand about his provision. Look what he says in verse 53. He says, Very, very, I say unto you, except ye eat, that, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now, now what you notice in verse 58? This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did, did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen. Now, the Catholic Church will tell you, this is why you have to have the Mass. Because the Catholic Church will tell you that when they offer that wafer up, a miracle happens. It's a, they're pulling a fast one on you. They will tell you that wafer literally becomes the body of Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the wine that they offer becomes the blood of Jesus Christ. And they will point to these verses and say, well, if you don't eat the flesh of the, of the Son of Man, you're not going to heaven. But the Lord qualifies that, as we'll see in the coming verses. First of all, he says in, in verse, 57, uh, verse 58, This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers. So Jesus is not saying it's the physical, it's the spiritual. Their fathers in the wilderness that they said, you know, Moses gave us bread for 40 years, manna for 40 years. Moses gave them that physical manna, but it wasn't Moses, it was God. And Jesus is saying, as we'll see, as we'll see in the next verses, it's the spirit that quickeneth, not the flesh. There is no miracle of transubstantiation. There is no miracle that happens when you take communion. Amen. Amen. It does not become anything other than the elements it was, such as the grape juice or the unleavened bread. It does not change. It's talking about having the spirit in you. Not as your father's did eat bread in the manna. Uh, he's telling them it's not his plan that they would uh, look at the, the physical, but that they would look at the spiritual. Look at verse number 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Let me read a couple of verses that we didn't read, but are really good from the Bible in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, verse 16 says, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Yet hath he not written himself, but Judith for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, he's offended. 
Matthew 13, verse 57. And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his, and his own house. Used to be a lady used to come to church, and almost every service after I preached, she, she was upset about something. And she'd come up and she, she'd say, All the time, you offend me. You've offended me. That's just the word of God, amen. You offend me. Uh, and I'm not telling you about her past, but she was kind of risque and all the rest of it. And, uh, but, you know, she would say, you offend me. And I said, the Bible says, if you're righteous, you'll not be offended by anything. But when people hear the word of God, when they come upon, upon the, the claims of the Lord Jesus in their lives, they start to say, well, who does he think he is? I'm the boss of me. I'm the one in charge of me. Who does he think he is? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Amen. He's the great I am. He's the bread of life. Amen. That's who he is. Now who are you? David said, I'm a worm. Amen. Paul said, I'm, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Who are we to tell Jesus you're asking too much? <laughs> Lord, this discipleship stuff, you're just asking too much of me. He said, does this offend you? Does it offend you following me? Does the word of God offend you? Do you read the Bible and say, well, I'm, I'm not, I know what the Bible says, but I'm not going to do that. It offends me. I'm not going to hear that preacher. He offends me. Every service, you, you offend me. It's the word of God, amen. Doth this offend you? He asks the question. He, he's telling them that he's the bread of life. That he is the one who would provide salvation. They said, this is a hard saying. Used to be in, in churches all over the land, you get hard preaching. Now you hardly get preaching. <laughs> Amen. They'll sing lovely songs. And everyone will stand and swing and praise and all the rest of it. And, and they'll do all these things. But when it comes to preaching, you will not get hard preaching. Right. You'll hardly get preaching. No hell. no hell. No heaven. No discipleship. You can live any way you like and still be a Christian. Now it's true that, that you, you get saved by coming to Christ and believing. But after you get saved, you've got to start following. And many of us followers said, uh, 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 that's just too hard for me. You, you, you don't know my background. This, this lady used to say, you don't know my background. You don't know my situation. And I say, you don't know my God. God can do anything in your life that you let him. Amen. He can save your life. Not only from salvation, but stopping you from taking your own life. This is a hard saying. This is difficult. Look at verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples mur murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Jesus hears your murmuring. I'm not going to go to that church anymore. They preach the Bible. That's hard stuff. I'm not going. The Lord hears you. The Lord hears me when I complain. Lord, why did this knee thing happen to me? Lord, I've got to preach tomorrow. How, how am I going to get through that? We ask him back, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Jesus hears. What you whisper, the Lord hears. Doth this offend you? He highlights their need to believe in him. Look at verses uh, 63 through 65. He says... Um, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Now that word quickeneth means to make alive. Amen. Why is it when you preach the gospel, when you give out tracts, it seems like some people are just, it's like talking to a brick wall. And then some people, they're completely open. It's low hanging fruit. You, you go to some doors and, and they're all, I don't want to hear. And then you go to some doors because it's the spirit that quickeneth. Our task is to go. Amen. We go and the spirit goes with us. And the spirit quickens. Brings life. It's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. See that body you're in just now. You know how much it's worth. 
Nothing. It's just dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's worth nothing. See your soul? It's worth everything. Because Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's how he values it. It's the flesh. It does not profit anything. He handed them a choice. Verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man could come unto me except it were given him unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I've been saved for a long time now. I was saved on March 8th, 1979. That's a long time ago. Over 40 years. Just barely. 40 years. I have seen so many people. They've come to faith. Believed. And through circumstances. And let's be honest. The devil. Have fallen away. Now that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't God's will. That was their will and the devil's will. Thank God some of them have come back. Amen. Amen. All of us have backslid at some time in our life. Amen. 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 But the question this morning is this. Will you go away? What is it that will make a Christian fall away from following the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we get our answer in our passage over in Exodus. You see, the children of Israel were stuck in bondage in Egypt. God was bringing them out of Egypt. And by the way, when you get saved, it's easy for the Lord to get you out of the world. Sometimes it takes time for the world to get out of you. Amen. That's why when I was first saved, I had a problem with cursing. I mean, I loved to curse. Loved it. But it took time and a hammer <laughs> for God to teach me that that's not the way, amen? Amen. But it takes time for the world to get out of you. And as the Lord is working in your life, the devil will offer you some compromises. You can believe, but don't take it too far. The first compromise the devil offered, let's uh, look at Exodus uh, chapter 8, verse 25. We'll return to John chapter 8 shortly. Exodus 8. You see, the devil hasn't changed. He uses the same tactics today that he used then. I was talking uh, the other week there down in, in the center of Glasgow to a guy who, who was, a, who was a, a Hindu. And he was saying, you know, we're all gods. God is in everything, and so we are God. That's what he said. And I said, you know, that's the lie of the devil in the Garden of Eden. Ye shall be as gods. He hasn't changed. The devil uses the same tactics because they work. They work. We fall for it every time. Brother Michael and I were out fishing the other night in the dark. Throwing a lure out there and bring it back in, and we got some fish. Amen. They're really small, but we, we got some fish. If the devil puts a hook out there, will you bite? Will you also go away? Exodus chapter 8, verse 25 says this. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Now notice this Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. He said, you can believe, you can serve the Lord, but just do it in the world. There are plenty of worldly churches out there, let's be honest. Amen. There are plenty of churches out there that you go there, it's like a rock concert. You will not hear the Bible preaching, amen. You will not hear about soul winning and serving the Lord. You'll be just... Like a little baby. Shh. Don't wake the baby. <laughs> Rockabye Christian in your sweet crib. The devil is laughing because he's got you where he wants you. Plenty of churches like that. 
Go serve in the land. Be a Christian. Believe what you want to believe, but don't tell anyone about it. Don't tell your family. Don't tell your friends. Don't get all excited about it. Go to the, the Ranger Celtic game and get yourself hoarse with screaming for your team. Be that kind of fan attic. But don't be a fanatical Christian. Don't be a fan of Jesus. Keep in the land. Stay where you are. Just sacrifice here. Satan will tell you that you can have Jesus and you can have the world too. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 24, Matthew chapter 6. If you're looking for a verse to memorize, here's a great one to memorize. Matthew chapter 6. Now, the devil will tell you this. You can be a Christian. You can, you can, you can have all the world. You can have all the world's music, all the world's philosophy, all the world's religion. You can go along with everything in the world. And you can have Jesus. Really? Let's see what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters. Now notice this. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have the Lord and the world. Amen. The devil will tell you, yes you can. You can have it all. But let me tell you, if you love the world, you hate the Lord. Amen. You'll find that in 1 John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the, love, the, 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 the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is of the, the, the flesh. It's not of the Father. If you love the world, you hate the Lord. If you love the Lord, you're going to hate this world. You cannot serve God and mammon. But yeah, how many Christians are trying to, and I don't know if I can do this with my knee, they're, they're, they're trying to walk in both camps. Pharaoh said, serve the Lord here in Egypt. Just be like everybody else. You'll be fine. Your friends will still like you. Your family will. See, this is wonderful. Let me say this. If you're committed to the world, your lifestyle is offensive to Jesus. If you're living for Jesus, your lifestyle will be offensive to the world. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot. The devil will say, yes, you can. You can do it. Look at his other compromise. Chapter 8 of Exodus, verse 28, says this. Now remember, the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. The Pharaoh still wanted to keep a hold of the, the, the Jewish slaves, children of Israel. So in order to keep them, he offered them compromises. The same compromises the devil offers to you and I today. Verse 28. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go. That you may sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very, very far away from me. Entreat for me. You can be a Christian. Just don't take it too far. You ever been told that by your friends, your family? You're just taking this too far. This, this Jesus thing, it's, it's, too, it's too much in your life. You can go to the Celtic Rangers game and scream your heart out. And they will, right now. Screaming and, and, and saying all kinds of vile and, and terrible things to each other. And come home and say, that was, a, that was my team. They'll walk around the streets all week with their team colors on. That's my team. But this Jesus stuff, just keep it to yourself. Don't tell anyone. You'll offend them. Exactly. Yesterday. Then over in Exodus chapter 10, verses 7 through 11, 
another deal the devil offers those who he can keep from following Jesus the way that Jesus wants is found in Exodus chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. He said, And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old and with our sons and with our daughters and with our flocks and with our herds. Will we, will we go? For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you. I will let you go and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord. For that ye did desire. And they were driven out from the presence of Pharaoh. From Pharaoh's presence. This Jesus should be for old people. <laughs> only old people. No young people, old people. This Jesus should only be for men. He said, let the men go. Lee, you see, God's plan is that when you serve him, you serve him with all. But the devil's plan is, no, no, keep your hand and your heart and your mind still in Egypt but go to church and sing, oh, how I love Jesus. One of the things that really annoys me when I knock on doors sometimes is you'll knock on doors and you'll say, I'm from the Bible Baptist Church. I'd like to talk to you about your need of salvation. I'll get the wife. <sighs> I'll, I'll get the wife. That, that's for the women. This, this religion stuff, that's not a manly thing. Or, that's for old people. Let's just keep this in its proper perspective. That's what the communists try to do in Russia. If you want to, if you want to believe in God, let it just be the old people. Let's not have young people following God and believe in this book. They've got their lives in front of them. They've got their career. They've got their prospects. Amen. God wants all of our families, to serve the Lord. There is such a battle going on today to control the minds of children. They are saying things and trying to sexualize children in primary school today, Amen. which I think is terrible. Let children be children. Amen. You see, the reason why the devil knows if he can have your children young, when they get older, they'll become pagans. Hitler did the same thing. Even the Catholic Church said, give us your child up to the year seven, and they'll always be part of the Catholic Church. If you give your darling sweet children to the world, they will give you back pagans. Amen. You can't let the world raise your children. Amen. You've got to raise them for the Lord. People say, well, you know, you can believe that Christianity stuff, but don't tell your children, don't tell your family, don't let it get out about you. Keep it to yourself. Jesus said, will you also go away? This is a hard saying. This is hard preaching. Amen. This is not hardly preaching. This is hard preaching. Amen. That Bible stuff is hard. They scratched their heads. You've just gone too far, Jesus. You're asking too much of us. He's asking too much of us. He's asking too much of us. Really? The king of the universe, the great I am, laid down his life, became sin for us, died on that old Roman cross, paid the price of sins on the cross forever, Amen. rose again victorious three days later, and he's asking too much. Amen. He's not asking enough. Amen. He should ask us more. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know how many minutes are in a day? 1,440. 1,440 minutes a day. 
But how hard is it for us Christians to read the Bible for 15 minutes a day? 1,440 minutes a day. Lord, I don't have time for the word today. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to witness. I don't have time. He's asking too much. You've gone too far, Jesus. They scratched their head and says, we can't go this way. And they left them. But not everybody left. Turn to John chapter 6 again. And we, we talk about Peter. We talk about his responses. He was a rough, round the edges kind of guy. But his heart was in the right place. John chapter 6, verse 66 says this. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, gone from thousands down to twelve. Uh, then Jesus said unto him, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, and, and, uh, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe, there's the key right there, and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. He went from tens of thousands to twelve. What a failure! He's a failure! He's blown it! The marketing department of the local church at that time will be, be saying, Lord, what are you thinking? We had a great plan. We had tens of thousands. The kingdom is yours. And you have to open your mouth and say a hard thing. He's asking too much. Is he? Is he really asking too much? You see, really, he should, we should be giving him everything. A person once asked me, asked me a, a, a message some time ago on, on, on how much should you give in an offering. And I'm not talking about how much you give, amen. That's between you and the Lord. But he was asking this question, should it be 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%? And the Bible says, actually, everything. Everything belongs to God. Ask the Lord what you should do. Have him put it in your heart, Amen. And he'll tell you the right thing. You know the reason why we don't ask the Lord? Because we know he'll tell us what to do, amen. Now that's not about, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about money, amen. The Lord wants your heart more than anything else. But what I'm saying is this. Is he really asking too much? Will ye also go away? Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Back to the world? Back to the world's church? Amen. Back to the church where you will not hear, you will hardly hear preaching. You will hardly hear about soul winning. You will hardly hear about uh, living right for the Lord. You will hardly hear about that. Tens of thousands left. Will you also go away? Is he asking too much of you and I? Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word this morning. We thank you for the movement of the Spirit of God in our service, Lord, speaking to my heart and to every heart here. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to realize that everything we have belongs to you. Not just 10%, not just 20%. Lord, you own everything. You are our Lord and Savior. We owe everything to you. Help us, Lord, this week and this month and this year to give our all to you that we might be a different, a peculiar people, zealous of good works, Zealous of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us, time of invitation. Use it for your glory and honor.